Last week we had Easter service and I mean this place was packed. Uh, we had, I believe, over 130 people in our congregation. That's the most we've ever had uh, since the three years that I've been here. And the question now after Easter is what's next? What's now? After such a big celebratory experience and after celebrating the resurrection of Christ, a lot of Christians ask this question, now what? Now what do we do? Well, all, you know, to answer this question, our staff at CCC gathered together and we came up with this sermon series through the entire month of April, which is called New Life in Christ. And that's the picture you see above you, above me, sorry. And what better way to see how are we supposed to live a new life in Christ by looking through the lens of Peter. Peter, who was a beloved disciple of Jesus. Peter, who had, uh, had highs in his ministry, and he had even the lowest of lows. He betrayed Jesus Christ on the night that he was, um, he was to be taken into the Sanhedrin, the day before his crucifixion. And Peter denied Jesus three times. But he didn't end his life there. Many people, when they have failures that are that deep and that traumatic, a lot of people don't overcome from those failures. And we see, however, that Peter is one of the very few people who have overcome, who has been able to overcome because he gets a new identity. And we talked about that a little bit last week in Easter Sunday, where Jesus Christ reestablishes Peter's identity. And so what better way to see it than go through the book of First Peter? And I just want to share with you that, if, that as a staff, we have studied the book of First Peter, and we came up with four distinct sections in which Peter, the beloved disciple, talks about having a new life. The first thing that he talks about is identity. That's the most important. He, he spends the first like two or three chapters focusing on our identity in Christ, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Then he talks about the importance of living holy because God is holy. And then the third section we're going to talk about in our family worship service on the 21st of April, he talks about how do we as Christians overcome suffering? Because all of us, believe it or not, are going to go through some form of suffering one way or another. But as Christians, how do we overcome that? And we're going to talk about that in the third week of April. And then finally, Peter ends his book in 1 Peter by talking about living in community. What does it look like to live in community with one another? So those are the four sections of 1 Peter that we're going to go through. And this morning, I wanted to talk to you about identity. Because Peter spends an inordinate amount of time talking about our identity in Christ. According to 1 Peter, in the first, even from the first chapter, he talks about how Jesus Christ died for you and me. That it wasn't something that we earned, just like we sang today. The, the songs were perfectly matched with today's sermon. It's nothing that you and I have done. It's not by any of our merits that we, that, that Jesus Christ died on the cross. This was all him. This was all his doing. And so today we're going to go into 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 9 and 10 to talk about identity. But before we do, I want to share with you all the importance and the meaning of identity. Because this is such an important topic in today's world. Identity is our sense of who we are as individuals, as well as members of certain social groups. So 
our identity is, again, that, that deep sense. Do you know who you are? A lot of movies these days talk about uh, identity. And I remember the first time I was uh, faced with this topic of identity was Lion King. I don't know if you remember, but Rafiki was asking, you know, uh, what's his name? Simba was down and out, and he had just lost his father. And so Rafiki is asking the question, do you know who you are? Remember? <laughs> he asked that question. And that's an important question for each and every one of us. And all experts can agree that identity is one of the building blocks of life because from our identity is where we're is going to be the trajectory in which we live our lives let's see why identity is important to a person now this is from experts this is not this is not biblical this is not like from the bible but i believe that the bible actually talks about all of this throughout the pages of this holy scripture but according to experts Identity is important to a person because, number one, the, I guess I should have made it bigger. I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, Self-understanding. Identity is important because it gives a person self-understanding. A strong sense of identity, uh, a strong sense of identity allows individuals to better understand themselves, their beliefs, values, strengths, and weaknesses. This self-awareness can lead to greater confidence and resilience in navigating life's challenges. Once again, we are all going to have challenges in life, just like Simba had challenges when he lost his father. But the important question that we need to ask ourselves as we dig deep into our lives is, who are we? Who are we without our support systems? Who are we when we lose a loved one? Who are we when things go awry, like financial troubles, or we go deep into debt, or our spouse leaves us? Who are you? And that's important. Number two, be, identity is important because it gives you a sense of belonging. Experts say that identity provides a sense of belonging and connection to others who share similar characteristics, experiences, or values. The feeling, this feeling of belonging is crucial for forming meaningful relationships and building supportive communities. Uh, and now the third one I want to share with you, I believe is actually going to be the crux of my message today. Identity is important to a person because it helps you in decision making. What do the experts say? Identity influences the decisions people make in various aspects of life, including career choices, relationships, and lifestyle. Understanding one's identity can help individuals make decisions that align with their values and goals. This is where I wanted to park a little bit. I wanted to park our car a little bit today in understanding the decision-making process and how identity is so tied to how we make our decisions. If you ask yourself, where does your identity come from? Where would most of you say it comes from? You could shout it out if you want. If you don't want to be wrong, I mean, it's okay. Huh? No? Job. Very good, yes. For many people in the United States and all over the world, your identity sometimes comes from the job that you have. What else? Where does identity come from? Age, yes. Family, yes. Wow, now everybody's, yes. Job, age, family. I really truly believe that ever since we were little, our identity actually comes from, yes, our family. And in order to discover the lies that are impacting your life, you have to engage in some spirit-led reflection. Think about how your family raised you. Can you identify 
certain sayings or uh, <clears throat> ways of life in which your family of origin lived? Like some of us here are Korean American. And because we are Korean American, there are certain things that your parents said to you that totally gave you an identity as a Korean American person living in the United States. Uh, if you are African American, if you are Latino, if you are Caucasian, every person comes from the origin of their family, and many times the family has dictated to you your own identity. Some of us have been raised in a family where you'll hear a lot of times, you're never going to be good enough. You're never going to amount to anything. How do you think that shapes your identity? Think about that for a moment. All your life, let's say, and some of us living in uh, Asian American families, some of us have gone through being a favorite. I don't know what it is about Asians, but Asian parents seem to favor like one child above another. I don't know if you've ever lived under that kind of, you know, uh, lifestyle, but if you have, you'll know that it's interesting that when you grow up and you become a parent yourself, many times unknowingly, you do the same exact thing that your parents did to you. And then you have your own favorites. Do you know how that affects the child, especially the one who is not the favorite one? It hurts. And not only does it hurt, but if you're not a favorite child, if you're kind of like the ugly duckling, do you know that for the rest of your life, you have to battle with feeling accepted? <laughs> Somebody's pointing to somebody today. I don't know, but I'm not going to look. I'm kind of going to go blind eye. I'm not going to do this. But I know what it's like. And many times the way our family did things affect your decision-making process? I want to share with you this morning that my family, who emigrate, immigrated to the United States from South Korea in 1978, that was when I was one years old. Do you know what the major saying in our family was? It was all about money. Money, that's correct. And I understand it now because as an adult now looking back into my childhood, I can see how difficult it was for an immigrant to live in the United States, not knowing how to speak the language. I mean, even though my father went to college and had a college degree, a college degree in Korea means nothing in America. They don't really care, you know, they, they never heard of, you know, Yonsei University. Who, who, who even looks at, you know, who even looks at um, you know, interview, uh, uh, cover letters and resumes, you know, with a foreign university, especially back in the 70s. And so my father, although he was a white collar working person, he ended up owning a dry cleaners which is what a lot of immigrants did. They worked sweat-laden, heavy burden jobs to get them through. But as you all know, for many of your parents who have emigrated into the United States, they live with a lot of fear, not knowing if they can pay the bills in time. And there was something about my family. My father had raised us in a way that he always said, never be in debt. And I don't know where that trauma comes from. I think in Korea, back in South Korea, where he was from, debt was a huge issue. I think if you were in debt, in Korea, you could lose everything. You could lose your land. You could lose your family members. I mean, that's the way my father operated. 
And so as a young child growing up, seeing my father always worrying about money, always worrying about the debt that he had, if he had any, always trying to cover things up, always trying. I mean, this is how we lived all our lives. Yet I didn't understand it at that young age. All I knew at a young age was, Howard, you need to have enough money so that you'll never incur debt in your life and that you have to be successful. And I remember my father always telling me, Howard, I never want you ever to do the job that I'm doing. And many of your parents have said that to you. And so you have lived all of your life trying to escape that which your father and mother did. And that's where I found myself. All of the decisions that I made to go to, which college I would go to, which, um, uh, which field of study I would study, it was all dictated because of my father's fear of being in debt. That's where it all comes from. And so I decided at a young age, I'm going to go to a, a really top tier university. My dream school was UPenn, Wharton School of Business. I did not get in, but, but I went to, I believe the second best, I went to NYU, Stern School of Business. And I, and I graduated with a finance and marketing degree. And I was making very high five figures at that time, which in 2001, uh, 1999, when I graduated, that was pretty big. It was a big sum of money. And just like one of our friends here in our congregation mentioned, I found myself identifying who I was by what I did. My job. I was very proud of working at Wall Street, Standard & Poor's. That's where I worked. And I loved my job. I loved it. I never wanted to leave, you know, Wall Street. I didn't. Because all my life, it has been shaped to understand that never go in debt, live a cushy life, and maybe help my father and mother retire early so I can give them the easy life. That's how I was raised. And many of you, if you can go back into your family of origin, you will start to see patterns that your parents taught you. And many times when you see these patterns, if something that you held dear, that your parents held very dear, if that doesn't happen in your life, the floor seems to crumble underneath you. Do you know how many people I know that have identified their life with what they do, their job? And how many times that, especially Wall Street executives, I knew one Wall Street executive who had, I mean, everything. He had a Ferrari, he had Lamborghinis, he had girls on the side, he had drug parties. I mean, I, he did everything. Everything that is possible to man. And he was living the rich life. And then the depression hit in 2008. And he lost everything because his, uh, his monetary empire was based on basically, um, you know, junk bonds and things like that. I mean, he was, he was a sleazy guy. You know, I, there were so many sleazy moments that I remember I was cold calling for him in an office and I was cold calling like 600 people a day just to get him some new sucker to go in and invest their money you know with him and it was always somewhere in the midwest like Nebraska or something you know Dr. Dr. Smith you know do you want to invest in the the next big Dove Audio I remember it was called Dove Audio and they were selling for like eight cents a share and some, some doctor in the Midwest bought like 500,000 shares or $500,000 worth of shares. And then Dove Audio like ceased to exist like the next day. It was terrible. He lost all his money. And this guy ended up committing suicide. From what I heard from my friends who worked there at Joseph Stevens. He committed suicide because all, in one day, like literally in one day, it was all gone. It was all gone. This is a person who had everything at one point in life, and in the next day, 
his identity was crushed because his identity was tied to how much money he was making and the toys and the cars that he was driving. This stems many times from our family of origin. Again, sometimes we hear the words, you're never good enough. So you know what we do? We, we compensate, we overcompensate, and we try to be the best we can be. And then we say, you know, we say to ourselves, I'll show them one day. And you know, you do all these things, you make it rich like this guy, my boss, my executive boss that committed suicide. And then one day he loses it all. That's the undulating, that's how life undulates up and down. And if your identity is tied to these things that can disappear like that, then when it actually happens, what do you have to stand on? What do you get to stand on? And just as much as identity comes from our family, I wanted to challenge you on this question. On the flip side, you have the power from the Holy Spirit to break past curses and create a new identity for your family in Christ. Here's the good news I want to share with you this morning. God says that when I bring curses, he says in Deuteronomy, that when I bring curses down upon a family, I bring curses down to the fourth and fifth generation. That's about a hundred years. But he says, when I bring a blessing upon your family, I bring them down generations and generations and generations. He's talking like thousands of years. He brings the blessing. Do you know that you and I all have an opportunity this morning as people who believe in Jesus Christ, who died for us, we all have an opportunity to take the curses that our families may have raised us with, and we have an opportunity to change it through the blood of Jesus Christ. Because Peter, and not only Peter, but Paul also says in his Gospels that the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that same Holy Spirit lives in you. That same Holy Spirit is living in you. And so what is he saying? He's saying that the good news is, is we don't have to live within this cursed sort of like family curse that our parents told us whether we're not good enough or we'll never have enough money or whatever, whatever drove us in the past. Now we can find our identity in Christ and have a new identity. And with that new identity, we can actually bring a blessing to our future families. And this is what you and I, we struggle a lot many times because quite frankly, my family of origin, as messed up as they are, Jews' family of origin is just as messed up. Maybe even more. But don't tell her I, but don't tell her I said that. I'm going to sleep on the couch tonight. I don't want to do that. But just as much, look, we both come from messed up families. We do. And because of that, have you ever been in a situation where you're raising your kids and you think one way that you should do this, but then another way it's like, but your wife is like, your spouse is like, no, don't do that. So like I remember when I was, you know, <laughs> in the past, uh, we fight a lot about, uh, you know, toughening up our boys. I'm under the belief that we should, like suffering creates, you know, good boys. Like, you know, it, 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 it creates like a stiff boy, you know? Like the more you suffer, the more the boys go through suffering, the better it is for them. I really believe that. But Jew, she believes like, no, don't touch them. Don't hit them ever. Don't, you know, I mean, she's very nice to them. So nice. And she believes in talking emotions out. I believe in hitting it out of the kids. <laughs> what? You're mad? <laughs> you know, and then, you know, I believe in hitting it out of the kids. And she believes in talking it out. Well, when you have those two different understandings of what it means to raise a child, well, guess what? And for you future 
parents, this is the struggle you're all going to have. Okay, so I'm just letting you know. But here's the blessing. You know what I've come to realize the most effective way? The most effective way to come to an agreement is actually to talking to your spouse about it first and saying, okay, what is this all about? And so Jew and I will talk to each other about many times like, okay, why do I feel the need to toughen these kids up? And then why does she feel the need to kind of, you know, uh, give them sort of like that easy life? Like, don't hit them. Don't, don't do that. And that's because we come from different perspectives. And she grew up watching her brother get beat up a lot. And because of that, he, you know, he has a hard time, you know, living freely now. He lives in this dungeon, this trap of never feeling good enough. And this is what happens when you beat your child like crazy. And this is why scripture says, even Paul says, do not exasperate your children. I truly do believe you shouldn't be punishing your children just because you're angry. And that's what Jew has taught me. But at the same time, I'm also telling Jew, she, as we talk to each other, she sees my side of the story, and I tell her that out of me, I have two sisters, one older, one younger. And I think one negative thing about the Korean culture is that the Korean culture loves to elevate boys for some reason. I don't, I, I mean, I, I, I don't want to say I don't know why. I know why. Because we come from a Confucian background. We come from where boys, we come from a custom where boys are honored and women are not as honored, although it's changing these days. And I'm glad, I mean, who knows, for better or for worse, what's going on. But all I know is that I was favored all throughout my childhood. And I saw the effects that that had on my sisters. Because my sisters didn't receive the same love that I received from my mother. They grew up feeling less than. And when I see my sisters now and the effect that my mom and dad had on them because of this Korean culture, I told you, I think we have to toughen up our boys. Because my mom, she doted on me as a boy. And I think it caused certain damages in my life where I'm not able to overcome that. And so, Ju and I, after talking together about that, we come to an agreement. But the most important thing you have to do, and this is for future uh, families that have, are going to have children, please spend time praying with your wife. Please. This is the best way I have come to know what God's will for us is. So I prayed and I prayed. And I'm telling you, God said, yeah, don't hit your seven-year-old son. <laughs> he did. He actually said, don't hit him. But Howard, I want you to sit down and talk to him about it. And so we end up doing that. And so you have the power to break some of the old curses that your family has given you. And in order to do that, I encourage you to pray together as a spouse to do that. So where does our identity come from? It comes from our family, but this is the good news. The gospel sets us free. And this is what Peter is talking about when he says in, verse, uh, in chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Look at what he says. First Peter, sorry, okay, I got to get to my first Peter. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness. See, he's calling you out of those, that, those curses, your family of origin, out of darkness, into his wonderful light. Do you see that? Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You are the people of God. Amen? Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Do you see what Peter is doing to all the people who believe in Jesus? 
He is using the language of adoption, actually. Once you were not a people, but now you're a people of God. That's adoption language. Back in Peter's time, by the way, adoption back then did not mean adoption what it means today. I think many times people adopt, uh, in, in the world we're living in today, adoption is more about like doing the right thing. It's more about like moral code, like, you know, oh, don't you feel bad for those kids and, you know, those kids in some foreign land and they don't have any food so let's adopt the child it's more about like feelings now but back in peter's time adoption was not about feelings it was actually a way in which rich folks who had a lot of land who had a lot of money but they didn't have children well when they die where does all the land go where does all the children go well it gets given to the state for them to you know, use and whatever. And so they didn't want to let that go. And so what they did was they would adopt a child so that when they pass away, all of their monetary wealth, all of the lands that they owned, all of the slaves that they had, it would all go to that, 100% go to that adopted kid. 100%. And that is what I loved about what what Mike said this morning before he was leading praise. He was talking about adoption as sons. Do you know what it means to be adopted? It means, at least in the biblical language, what it meant is that everything that the parents had is yours. And that's what Peter is saying here. He's saying that everything that God has is yours. Everything. And that is why God commands Joshua to not be afraid. Because everything God has is yours. And when you start to realize that your life was bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, and that everything that God has is yours, if you lose that car, are you gonna, is is the ground gonna sink beneath you? Is that your identity? If you lose, if you go into bankruptcy, is that going to be the last of your life? Is your life over now? Even if your spouse leaves you, is that going to be the end of your world? What Peter is trying to establish here is that your new identity, your new identity is as a chosen people. You have been adopted by Christ into his family. And so there should be nothing that we fear. And that's what I love about what Mike said about our speaker system. Yes, we got robbed this week. Second time in a week. And I was so upset the second time. The first time, I thought it was just a fluke. But now that it's a second time within one week, I know we're being targeted. And that's a bad feeling. But if my identity came with this church building, if, if, all our, if CCC's identity was all about money and, you know, and, and this, like speakers, and if that's how we define CCC, then yeah, if we're robbed, we're going to feel bad. We're going to feel down in the dumps. The same thing is with, the, again, our identity is tied to how we feel. And this is what Peter knows about even women. Look at what he says about women in the next chapter, chapter 3. He t- he's talking to women, wives, and, and specifically, starting from verse 1. But I'm going to read from verse 3. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. You know, customs haven't changed from Peter's time to now. And I think one of the big worries that women or one of the big identifiers that women have is with their external beauty. Many times women associate their worth by how they look, 
And the more people that they can get to tell them how good they look, the more they believe they're better than other people. That's what Instagram is all about. Taking pictures of yourself, looking like a model. But what happens when you're 60 or 70 or 80 and that beauty fades away? Some of those most beautiful women have a hard time coping with aging because they lost something that they identified with their entire lives. Their entire lives, they were told they were pretty. Their entire lives, they were told, oh, you know, you're so awesome. And, you know, they got thousands of likes and they got thousands of, you know, model opportunities and people gave them money in their 20s and 30s. But then in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, you start to see that dwindling slowly away. Look at media and Hollywood. Why do so many of these women, once they turn 40, 50, they, you know, they start doing all this plastic surgery to look young again? It's not because it's a disease. It's not because of something else. It's because of their identity is so tied to how they look. And once that look starts to fade away, their identity starts to fade away and they feel like they are nothing. They feel like they are not loved anymore. They're not getting the casting calls that they once got. They're not getting the producers calling them and saying, I want you to do this movie. I want you to do that movie. Now they get all these, you know, movies to be a mother, you know, to be the, the old lady in the movie. And they go through this massive depression. And Peter here is telling God's people, you were bought with Jesus Christ. Your value doesn't come by your external looks. Your value doesn't come by how much money you make. Your value doesn't come by how much possessions you have. Your value comes simply because Jesus Christ died for you and it comes from a gentle inner beauty a gentle and quiet spirit which never fades away <sighs> women that's the type of holiness which is great is is worth great in god's sight so ladies and gentlemen, it's not just ladies who go through this. It's also men with their financial troubles. Many times us men, we get our identity from our work and how much we make. Case in point, I don't know if you remember this gentleman, Alex Kearns. He was a 20 year old, 20 year old kid who in 2020, he committed suicide. Do you know his story? He was a Robin Hood trader. You know, when that app started, there was no limit. He started with $5,000. $5,000 of his money that he made being a lifeguard in the summer and some of the money that his grandparents gave him. And so he started playing with this app called Robin Hood where you can buy stocks and, you know, things like that, trade. And the whole thing about Robin Hood was steal from the rich. You can become rich too. So he started playing with something called options and puts and calls. Now, if you're not familiar with the Wall Street world, even my boss told me, Howard, if there's one advice I can give you before you leave this office, it's this. Don't ever F with puts and futures and calls. I mean, he, he, was, he cursed all the time. But he said, don't ever F with it. Don't even touch it. Even I'm the expert and like he deals with all that. And it's like, it's a gambling scheme. And so this kid, Alex Kearns, took $5,000 of his own money and he gambled it by playing with options and futures. And in the end, he must have made a ton loads of money because I think he got so excited. He started really playing around with it. And then one day he looks at his account, Robinhood account, and it's minus $750,000 quarter of a million dollars and he gets an email from robin hood saying you must pay 187,000 right now like within the next week the bottom fell out of him the bottom fell out just one day 
and he emailed furiously the Robinhood, you know, uh, customer support. He tried calling, but Robinhood didn't have a 1-800 toll number to call. And so what ended up happening? He felt like he was three, three quarters of a million, a million dollars in debt. He decided to take his own life at 20. He killed himself because he didn't want the shame of having his parents, which you see up there, and his little sister having to deal with this debt. So he killed himself. And this made national news. And then later, Robin Hood, finally, the customer service, I think this was to cover their butts, honestly, but they write him an email later, like 24 hours after his committing suicide, they say, you don't have to pay it back by the structure of your, you know, puts and, you know, whatever and all that stuff. But the way it was structured, he didn't have to pay it back. He died for nothing. But this is a cautionary tale about when we put all of our identity in the things of this world, in the things that can go under, in the things that in an instant can disappear. What is God saying to us? He is saying that our identity should be built on the solid rock that doesn't fade, that doesn't rust. Remember Jesus said, invest in the things of the kingdom of God where man cannot steal and man cannot take and things do not rust. And this is why the hymnist once said, he wrote, the hymnist wrote, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the hymnist wrote, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. So this morning, as I want us to reflect upon the scripture today about identity, whom or what is your identity based on? And if it's anything that's sinking sand, if it's anything that can disappear in one day, then your life will be just as up and down, topsy-turvy as that thing. But if you can put your identity in Christ and what he's done for you, then that's the solid rock on which you and I can stand.